Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tim Gleisner, Head of Collections at the Library of Michigan. Today, for the Michigan Notable Books Program 2020, we're here to talk with the author Esperanza Centron, the author of Shades uh, from Wayne State University Press. Uh, and again, as always, if you're uh, looking to support or want to support the Michigan Notable Books Program, we suggest that you contact the Library of Michigan Foundation and the contact information can be found either in the credits at the beginning of this segment or at the ending. And with that, Ms. Centron, how are you today? I'm fine, and you? I'm very well. It's good to see you today. And you're coming from us from Detroit, is that right? Right, right downtown. Right downtown, very nice. Yeah, and Lafayette so, Park. Say again? Lafayette Park. Lafayette Park, very nice. Right. And you live right by the uh, De Quinder Cup, is that correct? Exactly. And for our, for our Michigan viewers who aren't familiar with De Quinder Cup, it's a beautiful trail that cuts right through the heart of the city. It's an old railway, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. I've ridden it, and it's a beautiful place, and I advise anybody to go down there and try it. So welcome, Ms. Centrona, and I guess just starting out today to talk about your wonderful book, I'm just going to lead in with the fact that this is probably one of the few books from this year where probably within the first story, I knew that this was a winner. And I, oh, I mean, I, I was gripped, gripped by this book. Um, and I know there were several committee members who were gripped by this book. And early on, we knew that this was a contender, if not a winner. So congratulations on that. And thank, thank you for you. such a beautifully written piece of work. And starting with that, uh, Ms. Intron, just wondering, you know, what's your background? Uh, who are you? Where are you from? And how did you become a writer? Ah, okay. Thanks for all those really wonderful things you said. That makes me feel great. Uh, yo soy uh, Latina Negra. I'm Afro-Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Detroit of Puerto Rican descent. Okay, so that's who I am, I guess. And all of those things, of course, play into my writing. I think most specifically, because Detroit adds the texture to my writing. Um, if you're familiar with the stories, you know that, that most of the characters are African-American. There are some Latinos. And it's divided between East Side, West Side which is that traditional division in Detroit. Because as I was growing up, the West Side was the Sididi people, the upward mobile uh, people of color, okay? Right. Uh, um, and and uh, the East Side was, was the people that just came up from the South, the more gritty people, okay? Mm -hmm. That, of course, is a stereotype because, of course, both were on both sides. But that was the way people used to think about it. And, of course, Southwest Detroit, which is primarily Latino, right. is the, the southern portion of the West Side, which is really kind of a whole different community. But yeah, I'm, what else did you ask? I'm well, no, I, you know, just some background and, and how did you eventually become a writer? Like what, what, what got you to become a writer? Yeah, you know, my daughter says that some people are just born that way. She said some people are born odd. They're just compelled to do this writing that may never make them any money, but they just, they're just driven. So I think that that's probably me because I have like probably 10 projects going, but I've only had like four books published. So, so and I really don't make a lot of money on the so-called literary stuff. Right, right. I used to write. I used to write romance, sensual romance, and they sold well. And sure. um, yeah, it's a, genre fiction is, is, is just much easier to sell than um, so-called literary stuff. But honestly, you know, I've been, I guess, blessed with having a, a job for the last 20 some odd years so I could write what I wanted to write. I didn't need the money from writing. Now your job, I mean, you're, you're, are you a writing professor? Do I have that right? Or yeah, I teach writing. I teach writing and film because my master's is in film. My doctorate is in English literature. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, so I teach writing a lot, which is really tedious. But um, I guess I was going to say in our community, but in any community, it's really a necessary skill. Mm. And um, I, I believe they don't teach it as much in in high school and in, I mean, I find that uh, the students, because I, I teach at a community college. Sure. Um, many of our students come 
needing the basics okay. in terms of writing skills. But you know, it's you know, it's it's good work. I'm contributing to the community and getting paid. <laughs> you know. So, so what else? <laughs> why why do you feel like you have to write? I mean, why do you feel like you have to tell in, in this case stories of Detroit? Set what oh. in the sixties and seventies, and you're like, well, what what compelled yeah. you? That book has been with me for a while. Those stories, a lot of those stories were stories that my mother and my aunts told me about people, okay? Sure. You know, sort of like folklore, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are actually based on fact, you know? And so the stories build up. And of course, as a writer, I take, uh, I add and embellish and so forth, but, um, a lot of the stories are stories like my mother told me about her friends and people she'd heard about. And um, some of the stories, actually some of the stories are dreams. I do have uh, these waking dreams where I actually get up at like five or six o'clock in the morning and I have to write it down. Like, I don't know if you remember the story, Loose in Progress. It's about the little girl and she's, uh, she's like laying on a table and she's talking to this guy who's a cross-dresser. Yeah. And he sort of babysits her. Right. That was a dream. Okay. And I just woke up one morning and just wrote it down. And of course, I had to edit it probably, as I do most things, 20, 30 times. Sure. But most of them, like like I said, a lot of them are true or based on truth. And But they're just stories that accumulated over time. I've been writing that book for a long time. How long um, I think that it took a long time for Oh, probably over the course, maybe 20 years, I'd say, yeah. because the thing is, is that it didn't all come at once. <laughs> you know, you write a story and then you write something else. I mean, I'd, I'd write maybe, I'd write a story for that and then maybe, because I have like four books of poetry, but I might write some poetry in between. It's not, it's one of those things where you don't write it all at once. Sure. You know, you write it over a period of time. And... Eventually, and I think that one of the things, it's not exactly, if you read it, you know it's not, not exactly a PC book. I mean, there are a lot of things that people would object to. Sure. The vernacular, they might ex object to uh, some of the women, or at least one of the women is a prostitute. They might, you know, it's not a PC book. So I don't think it's something that would be like snapped up by someone. Um, and, and I think that it took... I was just really uh, grateful to the uh, editor at Wayne State that she actually saw that it was something that people would be interested in. And I've gotten some pretty, I think some positive feedback, which I think is really great because honestly, I know that, oh, I have to say this. One of my reviewers said that I was writing about the underbelly. I was really upset by that. My daughter said I shouldn't be because people are entitled to their, to their opinion. But Perfect. I don't think I'm writing about the underbelly. Just because I'm writing about people of color who are struggling, I'm writing about human beings. And I think that my goal is to really portray them as, as human beings so that people can relate to their various lives. Right. You know? And, I mean, to say that it's the underbelly is... I'm like, really? It's because these people are poor, you know? And then my daughter said, well, the underbelly of the pig is the best part. So what's wrong with that? <laughs> she, well, she's so right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> well, and I think, I think the part for me that I really, I mean, I just, I was so drawn into the characters. And the thing that I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I got a strong feeling, probably more than a strong feeling. I mean, a lot of these stories are intertwined with each other, yeah. characters over a period of time, and they kind of come in, in and out in different you know, stages of their life. How did that come about? Because, I mean, that, that had to be something that you invented along the way as a writer. Am I correct in that? Yeah, but then again, like I said, a lot of the stories were told to me, or at least the bases were told to me by my aunts. Now, my mother had seven sisters, so you've got all these women telling me these stories, right, right. and of course they're going to be about people that they know and so forth. It's, it's, so yeah, 
part of it is, of course, I, as a writer, wove those. But a part of it is that uh, these people were linked in some ways. Okay. Like uh, Belle, who is one of the primary characters, is a re was a real woman. I won't say her name, <laughs> but she was... She was a real character. She's no longer with us. Okay. But she was a real character. I mean, she was, she was this woman that, that came from, I think it was Alabama. And she had all these children. And my mother be befriended her. But she was this, this beautiful Black woman who really never really realized her beauty. Because oh. she was too busy fending for herself, you know, and fending for her children and trying to survive. But if she had been born in a different time, she probably would have had a very different life. Sure. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's a new day. I mean, I don't know if it's any better, but it's a new day. You know? I, I mean, don't that's, know. That, that's the thing, I, you know, and, and when you talk about survival, I mean, that's the thing about these characters where they're really trying to eke out their place in the city at that time. And, and I just got the strong sense of these people who are just, you know, trying in many ways to better their condition. And I just, again, was so drawn into all their stories. So tell me, like, with these pieces, you inherited them from your mother and your aunts. How often did you find yourself writing these? I mean, did you, did you, do you set up, do you sit down every day to write a little bit more? Or is it when the spirit takes you or something that you remember? Well, yes, not every day, no, because the thing is, like I said, in the interim, I've written several books of poetry. I also have like two or three other novels that haven't been published that I'm, I'm in the process of revising and seeing if I can get out there. So it's like you live your life. I remember I teach at the community college, which means I have to teach five classes a semester which is a lot, especially when you're teaching writing. Sure. So I don't have a lot of time, you know. So I, I write, of course, when I'm driven to, but it would be impossible for me to teach five classes. And at the time, too, I was raising my daughter, right. you know, and she had a life, you know, if, if you know anything about raising kids, my daughter played harp. She had to go to harp rehearsals and concerts and so forth. She had, she was ice skating so she had to go to ice skating sure. you know what I mean? and you're you're all these you you want your kid to have stuff right yeah, so yeah. the thing is, so in between taking her to ice skating and to harp rehearsals and teaching my class and correcting my papers i was writing so tell you me know? something about you said it really intrigued me right there you said i didn't write unless i was driven to what do you, what drove you to write what was that impetus if you will I don't know. Sometimes you just, like I said, like with the dream thing. Yeah. And this happened. Yeah. It's, it's weird. I don't even know how to explain it, but sometimes I'll be dreaming. Like this happened like a couple of days ago, but this, and I, I'll be dreaming a dream and it'll be happening like a movie, you know what I mean? Right. In your head. And I'll think, okay, this is really interesting. And then all of a sudden I'll wake up. And if it's something that I want to deal with, not something horrific, because if I'm dreaming something horrific, I don't want to deal with it outside of the dream. But if it's something, like like the story with Luce, it was very poignant. So I got up and I got on the computer, because I keep a computer right next to my bed and okay. a chair so I can, you know. But the other day I woke up um, and I, it was a romance story. And I ended up, I, I woke up and I wrote like 2,500 words because mm -hmm. it just flowed like that it's it's sort of like a blessing isn't it yeah it's like a weird but it doesn't happen all the time but it happens enough for me to recognize when i need to get up right then even if i'm tired and even if i have other things to do i need to get up right then and get on the computer and just lock it in it may not even be something that i'll finish later but it's it's preserved in case i want to go back to it you know? So tell me, like, you have these dreams where you feel compelled to write, but is there ever a memory that you're just, you know, standing or sitting and suddenly you remember, oh, yeah, aunt so-and-so mentioned this story, I should write that down. Does it ever happen? Yeah, well, that happens 
Yeah, but I haven't, you know, I've sort of, when I was writing Shades, that that's what was happening. You know, mm-hmm. periodically I would get those. And occasionally with the poem, because I, one of the things like with the poetry, I've been dealing with um, spirituality, you know, because I'm not necessarily a religious person, mm-hmm. but the concept of, of God and, and cause I was raised Pentecostal, which I don't know if you know, but that's like Holy Roller. Yep. <laughs> you know? And then I converted to Catholicism and now I'm an agnostic, <laughs> but at any rate, so, so things, religious things for my family, because right. my grandmother, she, she didn't even believe in, she believed in healing hands. She didn't believe in allopathic medicine. Okay. okay. So those kinds of things come and then I have to write them down and sort of figure them out. I guess that's what we do as writers. We, we're trying to figure things out through the creation of characters, through the creation of melodic language or whatever form. I mean, it's the same, I think, with any artist. When you're painting, if you're a painter, you're, you're working things out, you right. know? I don't know what you're working out, but you're working things out. That psychological, spiritual, I, I don't know. Maybe oh, that's just oh, that makes sense. So let me ask you, so like when you're writing them out, you write it out, but then you mentioned earlier that, you know, you edit 20, 30 times sometimes. Yeah. Do you find a, somehow almost like a, a sculptor that you're getting down to that piece? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, when, exactly. That's a good analogy because it is like sculpting because you're like, you're, you're cleaning away the parts of the rock that are not necessary to that thing that you're going for and it is it's really like sculpting and it's hard it's like what it what was it was it uh, ginsburg that said you have to kill your darlings you know <laughs> because you know we as writers every word is beautiful that's my word <laughs> that's my <laughs> phrase you know but i find especially the novel i'm 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 finishing the last hopefully the last edit on a it's a western a mystery, a Western that I've been writing for a couple of years now, and I'm finishing the last. And it's so different from the first draft. Mm. Um, it's it's like it's about it's about a little over a hundred thousand words now. But I think I've probably killed about twenty thousand or thirty thousand words. Killed twenty or thousand of my darlings, sure. you know. Well, but I it, asked about that. I mean, you talked about romance. This obviously is literary fiction. You're talking about a Western mystery. Like, what grabs you? I mean, like, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's one where, thing you're like, I'm going to do romances now, and I'm going to do literary. Like, what? I read a lot, and yes. and I like to try different modes, if you will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's like the mist. The Western is really, um, it's it's romantic. It's 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 the premise is that it's a young uh, ex slave who escaped from slavery, but it takes place in 1870, which is after the Civil War. And she sell, she's, she's settled in Colorado. Okay. Okay. And she's in a relationship with this expatriate Brit. Okay. Which is, it's, it's a, 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 a basic romantic trope, only the female is a different kind of character, right? Yeah. But I started writing it and the research just grabbed me. And, and I just started, you know, the research, finding out like, for instance, what people wore at that time, what people ate, you know, and it's just, I just started writing in it. And it's a, it's a whole novel now. Well, you know, now, here's something interesting, right? Because with this book, what I loved about this was, I saw Detroit through your eyes, right? Uh-huh. And, and to me, any good book, any book of fiction, the setting is, is just as important as the characters in many ways. That, that's just for me. That's my personal. I, I agree. So I agree. when you're writing a Western about Colorado, do you have personal affinity with Colorado? I mean. I actually traveled out there just to see what it was like. Oh, you did? You know, Very nice. A, yeah, just to get a sense of, of you know, the, the terrain mm-hmm. and so forth. But the thing is, is like there's so much in terms of 
uh, vegetation and so forth. You can find all of that. Like the internet is so wonderful, accessible. It's, it's a lot of research, a lot of reading. And I, of course, I read a lot of uh, novels written during the period, as well as Westerns and historicals and so forth. You know, immersing myself in that atmosphere. I mean, you know, I don't know, for me, the, honestly, the research is as fun as the writing, you know, because it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's fun. I you know. know. As a librarian, I love to hear that. That's awesome. That's great. So <laughs> well, do you go down, because, do you go down, huh? in, do you go down to the main library on Woodward ever to do any of your research when you yeah, well, we have a branch over here that's really useful. The Elmwood branch okay. is right over here, and they're very helpful, and they can order stuff. I go down to the main library when I want to see pretty, because it's pretty. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's like a temple. It's a beautiful library, beautiful. and it's right across from the DIA, one of my favorite places to go. Yes. You know, I mean, you've got that, the Art Institute, and then you've got the Historical Museum. Yep. It's like... It's a little piece of heaven. Oh, it, it really is. is. It is. It's a no, little piece no. of heaven. They used to have the, the children's museum, but now it's something else. I don't know what it is. They put the children's museum on another street. I think that that was rude. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, so you talk about all this research you're doing. So like for Shades, did you have to do any research? Did you have to go back and look? No, I really didn't. <laughs> because honestly, um, of course I lived through a lot. I was a kid, but I was still cognizant, you know, right, right, right. Um, but, um, but still, and, and also I had my, my aunts, my, several of my aunts are still alive. My mother's gone, but several of my aunts are, and I can ask them like, there's the one um, story in there, Belle fills a hole. Yeah. And it's about Belle when she becomes religious. I mean, she goes to God. And my aunt, who was very religious, I called her and I would ask her and we would go over, you know, what what uh, hymns were popular. Um, and, you know, we would talk about ser uh, the services and the preachers and so forth. And she would sort of ignite the, the images in my head and I right. could just transfer them to words, you know. But yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah. And that, so your aunts, have they read any of the stories at all? Have any of your aunts? No, one of them, only one of them. The rest, no. And, and the, the, one, the one who's read it, did she recognize any of the characters you were writing about at all? No, and she kept saying to me, and this is, she, she's the one that's closer to, to my age because, you know, there are enough of them to be close to my age. Sure, sure. And, and she was actually uh, raised with me. So, so she's, oh, it's a whole story. Right. But at any rate, she, she is sort of, she was like, where did you get this from? She was, it's like, to her, it was foreign. It was all, it's like, what is this? Who is this? And she, didn't, she didn't even recognize anything. But then she is very into herself okay. i love her but she's she's very she's a beautiful woman right right <laughs> she's just very insular makes sense makes sense so let me yeah. ask you this so uh you talk about all the research everything else what writers do you turn to for inspiration like what writers would you typically turn to to read and you know maybe pattern your work after if, if you do and i i'm just asking Oh, yeah, because I always tell my students, you know, when you first start writing, it, you're like a baby learning how to speak. You listen to your mother, right. you know, and you speak like your mother. There are so many. I mean, one of my favorite is Ana Castillo. Uh, she wrote, Pill My Love Like an Onion and So Far From God. Beautiful. I mean, just poetic, just beautiful. The language. And they're very womanist pieces. Um, but then, of course, I like, um, uh, yeah, of course, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, read all those. But I'm a real sci-fi fan, too, even though oh, I don't really write. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, Joan um, uh Octavia Butler, oh, my God, and uh, uh, Nalo Hopkinson, 
Um, and even some of the older ones, um, I cannot think of her name, Pauline, uh, because when I was in college, we did a lot of, I did a whole thing on the history of, of like, for instance, the Black novel, the mm -hmm. African-American novel, and so forth. And there was stuff written in the late 19th century that people don't even know about that, you know, science fiction and stuff that that, that was really influential. But I guess, because my daughter wouldn't let me put, point this camera at my library <laughs> she said it was too messy so oh. she made me put to the rear wall you want to point it now you can point it. she's not there is she? she set the camera and i'm not gonna move <laughs> it <laughs> you won't know what you would get if i move this okay know? okay okay but Ooh. yeah i'm to, over here there's like books and books and books but i read a lot a lot how did you get into science fiction? Science fiction, I mean, that's very interesting. I love science fiction. I mean, like, what grabbed you? Was it when you were a kid, older, like what? Oh, always. Um, you know, it starts, like, with, with reading um, mythology. Oh, sure. You know, Greek mythology and so forth. And then fairy tales, you know, when you're... And then science fiction, to me, is a natural step because it's all about suspending, you know... Uh, that sense of belief and so forth and being able to enter worlds, okay? I like science fiction, of course, that, that has a, a social, political stance. I mean, of course, um, the Dune series is important. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm Asimov and Arthur C. Oh, Clarke. And so I'm like, so yeah, I, I, know, it's, I don't know. It, my thing is that. Those were my favorites as a kid. Arthur C. Clarke, the Dune series. I mean, those I could just go on and on about. That's fantastic. Exactly. And I always loved how science fiction would mirror the real world. It was almost kind of, you know, like Herbert would take yeah. the real world and just pattern it into a, an imperial galaxy. It's a fantastic thing. Exactly, exactly. It, yeah, and that's why, because I, I mean, of course, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, and um, what was it, the, the left hand of God and the dispossessed, okay? I, when I read those, I'm like, oh my God. And see, that's what I'm saying. You talk about genres and sticking into genres. I'm like, why? You know, <laughs> because they're so, you know, no, no, why not try this and try that? And so I didn't attitude. pay for it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> no. That's a wonderful attitude. So my, <laughs> that's why I write I'm trying to write a mystery well I've written a mystery I don't know if it'll sell but and romance and literary fiction and poetry because it's all words it's all words and you know if you like words you, why shouldn't you try as many forms as you can so how, how would you define this one I mean I know how I would define it I think I've already said it but how would you define this one how would you define it literary fiction well, I, that's that's what the editor said. I, I honestly, I found this to be the Detroit equivalent, but I mean, it's very much standing on its own. But the only author that has grabbed me as much when it comes to fiction, if you know the author from the west side of the state, Bonnie Jo Campbell. And oh, she would paint, I haven't looked her And up. She, she would paint these evocative stories in the southwest, in the Kalamazoo River Valley. Well, I felt your stories were just as good, um, but obviously in Detroit and you know I want to talk more about Detroit because obviously that's a huge part, part of your book but how did it figure in your work like how did you how did you put Detroit into your work obviously these characters are there but I mean I was just so intrigued with that. Uh, Detroit to me I don't know how to even it just is it just is it's like you know, I've lived other places. I've lived in Memphis. I've lived in upstate New York, Albany for years, you know, but I don't know, Detroit is home and it is like a skin that I wear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is, it is. And I know her really well. You know, I know her history. I, I have a sense of where she's going. And I'm saying that because it, she's blessed to be a, a her, you know, in terms of um, 
I'm in love with the river. Uh, the people are so varied. I'm, I'm adjusting to, because I live in downtown Detroit now, and you know, we've been gentrified. Right. And I'm adjusting to the newness, which is really difficult. But I was here when the factories failed. Right. I, um, I was working for city council at the time. This was in the late 80s. And um, I used to have to go as a part of my job to the, uh, to the union meetings where all these old guys would get together. And they'd be crying. I mean, because the factories are closing. They had no recourse, okay? So I, I know that Detroit. I was a kid when Detroit was burgeoning, when it was everybody had a job and was driving Cadillacs and partying, you know what I mean? So I've seen... Detroit's many faces. So Detroit is me. It's a part of me, you know. Um, and I know that, you know, uh, the Polish area, I mean, because I used to work at a, a restaurant in, in Hamtramck when it was still a Polish area. So can, I ask and now, huh? can I ask you about that? Because one of your stories takes place in that restaurant in Hamtramck. Is yeah. The same restaurant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the White Tower. Yes, I was a, like 16 or something because my mother was the, um, she was the manager of that restaurant. Really? And we used to be down from Dodge, Maine and Dodge, Maine was, was full and working hard and the guys would come through the restaurant. And that was, and, and Hamtramck was still a, a Polish town. This was before Coleman gave them the right, uh, tore down all those houses and built that GM plant that tore down half the, the population, whatnot. Uh, but then, and I've lived in Southwest Detroit when my dad, before my dad went back to Puerto Rico. So I'm familiar with Southwest Detroit. And when we, uh, my grandparents used to live on the North End, which is the East side of Woodward. And then my mother who got uppity moved to the West side. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, it's, I know this city. Hey, this is my city. I know, I know, it's crazy. No, but, it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I know really, the city. I really, well. I really appreciate <laughs> that. Like you said, you just know it. It's in your blood. It's in your, you know, yeah. it's, it's everything you breathe and see every day. I think that's a lovely thing. Exactly. Country. That's a wonderful I mean, because I, I went back to Memphis because I used to live in Memphis. Uh, I lived there for about five or six years. And it didn't feel like, I, I didn't, you know what I mean? I didn't feel that affinity mm -hmm. that I feel. And that's why I came back here, you know, because I was living upstate New York. I had a great job. I was doing fine. But I came back here because I missed it. This is my home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me ask, anyway, when, when you're writing Shades, like, what was the hardest part? I mean, like, you talk about this being home and everything you knew. I mean... What was the hardest part getting this all down on the page? The edits. <laughs> I don't think it was, it wasn't hard at all. I mean, I don't, okay. for me, I don't think, I mean, the rewrites are always the most difficult thing. You know, getting the language, the rhythms of the language, and still, right. and still maintaining um, the images and clarity and so forth. So rewriting to me is the most difficult thing of any but writing shades was not a difficult thing. It was just rewriting. Okay. You know? Okay. And and is there a person who looks over your work before you submit it, other than an editor, your daughter? No. My um, when I was doing romance, I hired an editor that I used to a young woman who used to really reasonable who used to uh, read and give me edits but with this no not really I wish I, I wish I did because I think I could really make it much more crisper if I had external eyes but no I mean you know I, I tend to write um in isolation so is that because they're your babies is that is that the reason why no it's just that I don't have anyone the, Honestly, I don't have a lot of friends who are literary. Okay. Is that the word? I, I, that's terrible. I mean, I work at no. a community college and most of my colleagues are meat and potato people in terms they do their job, they're in, they're out. It's not, I think if I was at maybe, maybe if I was at 
uh, a university, I'd have a more interested, you know, because I mean, we teach basics. Sure. I mean, I tend to teach creative writing and film and stuff, but most people just teach comp and they, the workload is really large. Right. They don't have time to read my stuff, you know? Okay, okay. And Do you write? Do I write? I try. I'm not a good writer. I mean, I, I, I write some poetry. I, I, I've, I've, ta I've thought about writing about my hometown in Milwaukee, uh, you know, but other than that, um, I don't, I have a real block when it comes to writing. So Milwaukee is a great town. Well, Milwaukee is a great town. You're right. And, you know, I think part of it for me is I'm one of your community college students, right? I was a high school dropout. So ah. I've always had that whole stigma, if you will. You know, like I got my high school. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I got my high school education at the Milwaukee Public Library downtown. I'd get on the bus. I'd go down to the town. And that's where I got, that's where I got my education. So I'm a lot like probably some of your students, you know. And I'm, That's a story right there. It That's is, a it is right. but, you know, I mean, like, who's going to read about Milwaukee? I mean, Detroit's so much more. Detroit's got to just, ah, right, come on. Milwaukee is a cold. What are you, you, it's up to you to represent, okay? You, All right. You got to represent me. Well, now, but this, okay. is about, this is about Esperanza Centrone right now. So <laughs> let's, let's turn it around. So you're representing Detroit. In your mind, what's that next Detroit book? Is this the only Detroit book by Miss Cintron, or is there another one coming? I'm trying to think of what else I've written. Actually, um, I'm uh, this the Detroit the uh, the the book of poetry that I'm um, right now. It's a chat book. Right. It's called Boulders. It's called Boulders. Uh, Detroit nature poems, and it's all about. Um, what I think is natural to Detroit. Now, of course, uh, you know, they talk about the feral fields and so forth, you know, because we've had so much demolition. Sure. Um, and I, I talk about those kinds of things. I talk about the beautiful Detroit River, which I love. Mm -hmm. I talk about the actual demolitions, what happens. You know, recently they tore down uh, Joe Lewis, which was supposed to be, you know, represent <laughs> Joe Lewis and the, the Okay, and, and it's it's at a prime piece of uh, riverfront property, right. but it took a while for them to tear it down, and it's right behind where I work, right behind behind the college. So um, I write about that, because that in itself, if you watch the destruction, they didn't blow it up. There was no implosion. They actually used the wrecking balls and the so forth, and that was a real interesting thing because you had all this gravel and crumbling and the sounds of the sand falling and so forth. Very natural. These are, you know, people don't think of these things as nature, but this is nature because you're, you're tearing down something and sending it back right. to where it came from, you know, um, which is a very natural thing. Um, and I write about it's they're all like Detroit poems. I talk about just things that people don't. I mean, it's not just about trees and whatever, but we have lots of like around here, we have every bird that you can think of. I see cardinals, I see robins, sparrows, those stupid seagulls that poop on everything. <laughs> there, we have, uh, uh we have. Uh, raccoons because okay. of the Dequinder cut because it was so it was feral for so long. Sure. We've got possums, we've got foxes. So you know we're a city, but we have nature. So let me ask and about, I don't think. Let me ask about poetry though. So is poetry? Are you writing poetry because it's more immediate than fiction? Is that the reason why? Like why poetry? What what is it about poetry? Um. I don't know. It just can It just is. Okay. It's like, it just, you know, it, when you write, I think for me, the form dictates itself. Mm. You know, if you've got, I mean, because I have written prose, I mean, poetic stories. Um, my book, um, what is it? What Keeps Me Sane? It's poetry, but the, it's stories. It's a story of four women. So I think that the the form dictates itself. 
I just facilitate it. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. Some, it can come out as a poem. It can come out as a story. It can come out as a novel. It just depends on what the content shapes itself into. Uh, and it's like, it's not, it's, I don't, like pick and choose you know what right, I mean? right. not consciously not consciously you know when you write do you say i'm gonna write a poem or do you say i'm gonna write a story or do you i'm a teacher i'm sorry I... oh, that's, right. that's right you're a good interviewer um uh, yeah i would say i probably start out with the idea that i should write to a certain form and you really? see that it should be more organic well i I, I'm only speaking for myself, right? But I, I feel like the thing that I think is always a, an inhibiting factor for amateurs like myself is the fact that we don't always know what the proper forms are. And, you know, I've, I've read- Proper forms. Exactly, that's exactly. And that, might, that's the, and that might be part of that, that mental hang up, you know, about knowing, well, I should write it this way because that would show that, you know, I actually know what I'm doing instead of just- right? Instead of just laying it out, you know, which you're is Tim, right? you're, say again. You're Tim. Yes. Okay, Tim. Yes, ma'am. Free your mind. Okay. You really need to just like write and stop saying this is going to be. A, you can always go back and change it. Okay. It's, it's not like we're chiseling it in stone, right? Right, 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 right. You can always go. Just let it flow and let it be what it's going to be. You might even create a whole new genre, you know? I mean, I know, I and mean, it's, it's crazy because like people do get on me because I try all these different things, but I enjoy it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's freeing. It's, it feels good to write a mystery, so I write a mystery. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, it may not be the best mystery. It'll probably be a better love story than mystery because I'm better at writing love stories, yeah. but that's not the point. You know, how much money am I going to make on it anyway? You know, I got a good pension coming whenever I decide to, grow, to, to retire. So I'm straight, you know, <laughs> I'm straight. I can write what I want to write, you know. Well, let me ask so, you a question. So like when you get your students in there, a lot of them are dealing with the basics. But do you ever find, because you're a wonderful teacher. Oh, you, sweet. Do, but do you ever, <laughs> do you ever find that, that, that diamond in the rough in one of your classes, you know? Oh, yes. You do? Yes. I do. And you know, the thing is, when I first started, um, I was like one of the younger ones. Like I was in my late thirties. Okay. Yeah. And all these, there were all these old folks up in there that had been teaching since the school opened. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were like, Oh, these stems are horrible. Oh my God. They don't know anything. They're so, and I, okay. I went with them like, Oh, so we've got that kind of, then I started interacting with these people. And I realized that my students were like me, you yeah. know, they were from, they were from the area. Right. They were struggling to get educated. You know what I mean? And I fell in love with them. I mean, I really did. Okay. Right. I, when I, I always find like, for instance, this last, I taught creative writing right in the midst of the pandemic. Okay. We were having the class and I really, I had like these 15 really great students and a couple of them were really good writers. Some of them were just strugglers. Right. But then this, they started, I started teaching them online, which means they had to upload everything. So we went through the thing. But we had the last poetry assignment, and my last, it's, it's the most rigorous assignment, um, where they have to write in different forms, they, they have to write a villanelle, they have to write a sonnet, they have to, okay. This one older man, well, he's older, he's in his 30s, which is older, because my students are usually in their 20s and teens, okay. Sure, sure. He wrote some of the greatest stuff. I mean, he ended up getting an A in the class, and he was one of the most oh, I don't know what I'm doing kind of people, you know. He was one right. of the people who was like, I'm, I haven't been to school in a while, and this is, you know, and I'm like, you know what, boy, you shine, you shine, you know. So, yeah, and that happens, i say, pretty regularly. I mean, you've got a lot of people that if you just believe in them and then show them methods to achieve, right. then they will surprise the heck out of you. But if you come at them saying you can't do it, then they can, they're not going to, because they're going to lose the faith that they had. 
And see, that's what some of my colleagues were doing. They were coming, because, you know, it's sad to say, but a lot of them were ex-hippies that had gotten this job and been on this job for a hundred years, moved out to the suburbs, right. and lost their original belief structure, you know, fell into suburban culture, you know, and, and stereotypes, and they brought it back to work with them, which is not a good thing for our students, because my students are primarily African Americans, Arabic, and Latinos, okay? And if they're, if they're Anglo, they're usually Anglos that don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they, the whole thing is that um, you just have to, you have to have, to, and I know we're not supposed to be talking about teaching. I'm so no, 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 this is fascinating. Honestly, some of the feedback I've gotten on these interviews is people really love to hear about the writing experience. And I wanted to know when you're dealing with these students, do you ever share any of your work with the students? No. You don't? No. no. Why not? Students tend to think you want to, them to imitate you. Oh. And then they try to write like you write. And so I never share my work. I, I share everybody else's work with them. As many different styles and whatnot as I can bring to them. But never my work because then they will try to write just like you. And I don't want anybody to imitate my style. Okay. All right. In fact, I usually don't tell them that I even write until the end of class. You know, and a lot of times, you know, they, they're nosy. <laughs> you, know, you know how students are, they're, especially with, with, the, with, with these things here, these phones. Yeah. They'll, under the table, they're like, I'm like, you know. I hear you. I got you. I know. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. So the title, Shades, what's the significance of Shades? Why, why that title? You know, I don't know. It it came with the stories. <laughs> it's sort of like it came with the stories. I think it has, you know, in African American culture and in Latino culture, um, you have a hierarchy of shades in terms of the closer you are to the colonist, okay, the lighter you are, the more prestige you have in the community. This is, of course, changing, but it's still, uh, you know, and also the sh wearing shades was a cool thing to do, you know, and that that whole cool aspect. And the, the, uh, the concept of, of shades as, as haunts, as ghosts, okay, in the sense that these are ghosts of the past. Life is changing now, and I'm sort of looking back. So shades, it's like a whole, it's so multidimensional. That's why with this book and with another book, and I do try to do it often, I'll have this whole uh, dictionary definition in the beginning. And that's to give you, it's sort of like, when I was doing that, I was thinking about, you know, in the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, um, when Shakespeare has the narrator come out and he tells you about the Capulets and the Montagues. He tells you pretty much the whole story, and then the story breaks out. So I, my definitions at the beginning are sort of like that narrator in Romeo and Juliet. They're, they're trying to give you things to look for, hints to what's going to happen in the stories. And that's uh, oh, that's yeah. beautiful. So let me ask you this. So like, you talked earlier about the gentrification of downtown Detroit and the neighborhoods. I mean, do you miss this Detroit? Do you do you do you find yourself sometimes? Yeah. You do. Why? Yeah. Well, because in this part, even though there was a lot of struggling and difficulty, mm -hmm. um, it's like I wrote in a poem. Black people took a taste because they were there were a lot of people who were. Uh, fully employed, who were making good money, who bought homes, who took care of their families. Um, at that time, we were one of the one of the primary homeowner cities in the country. Right. Okay, because black people had jobs; they could buy homes. Not just black people, but Latinos. They could buy these homes and so forth. They had benefits, hospital benefits, and so forth. Uh, and, and it was a, 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 a really good time. It was also a time when we were beginning to reap 
the rewards of, of, of the civil rights movement, the movement that had been going on for a couple hundred years, we were finally getting some legislation mm -hmm. where we could vote. I mean, I actually, I went to college um, on a scholarship that I think was definitely related to the fact that um, I was uh, black and Latin and female and people died for me to go to school. Do you know what I'm saying? People actually died and I'm buried in shallow graves down south. Okay. But the thing is, so in the 60s and 70s, it was a really good time. It was a difficult time for some people because some people were still struggling. People are always going to be struggling. Oh. But for a large portion of the population, we were living pretty well. I mean, my mother, that restaurant that I told you about, the mm -hmm. she was the first black person to work at that restaurant. Really? They were paying her 99 cents an hour. <laughs> and she was managing the joint. <laughs> okay. This, she worked up to management but because she was such a hard worker, you know, but she would never, like before that, she would never have even been allowed to do that. The best that she could have done would have been to work in someone's home. Right. Okay. But to work in a restaurant, even though we did everything in that restaurant, we mopped the floors, we cooked, we waited on customers. It was a step up because before that, only white women could work that job. Okay. So, so I'm saying the 60s and 70s, yeah, it was rough, but there was a lot of good stuff. And I was the first person in my family to go to college, okay. you know, which was on my mother's side. I mean, on my father's side, uh, a lot of people were still in Puerto Rico and they were still, they were in various economic levels. But here in Detroit, on my mother's side, I was the first person to go to college and graduate, you know? So, yeah, I do so miss Detroit it. back then really was a land of opportunity in many ways. Yes. And then the 80s came. The 80s came. What happened? The 80s came and everything just... The factories. You know, it just disappeared. Yeah, because the factories closed. Uh, um, and then, you know... You had, I don't know what they were doing on Wall Street, but it messed up a whole lot of stuff, you know. I know it's just like, and and also uh, a conservative thing started coming back. You know, the whole conservative mentality came back and it just, a lot of stuff just fell. And then Detroit began to fell because, you know, in 72, we voted Coleman in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people a lot of money stopped coming to Detroit because we had a black mayor at that time. Okay. I'm talking federal monies and so forth. They didn't like Coleman. So we start having difficulty keeping up um, uh, the civil, the, the, the city's services and so forth. So, I mean, yeah. Anyway, see, you get me talking. I just run oh, on and on. Wonderful. It's great. <laughs> so let me, and actually, I was going to ask you about that. With the current situation right now, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, I mean, how do you feel your current work is being influenced by all these outside, I mean, really uh, seismic events that are going on in our country? We talked about the pandemic with the teaching and things like that. Well, the teaching is definitely affected because, uh, you know, I have to do a lot of it online, which I really hate, you know, because right. I like interacting with people. But as far as the other things, I think that's yet to be seen. I mean, I, I have no idea how all of this is going to affect all of us in the long run. I mean, we've been more or less uh, sequestered since March, okay? I mean, and we're beginning to get out a little, but we don't, I mean, it's still really rough. I don't, you know, that... <sighs> I can't even imagine how it's going to affect us all in the long run. In terms of the writing, yeah, it creeps in there. I mean, the fact that we're, I mean, I, even the last three poems that I've written, uh, they're called Worried Woman Blues, mm -hmm. which uh, there's a, a, it's a trilogy. It, it's about, you know, what's to come, but it's not just the pandemic. It's also global warming. It's It's also the fact that that person that's in the presidential office right now is just making decisions. Can you imagine pulling out of the World Health Organization? What kind of craziness is that? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like 
so yeah it's it's not just the pandemic it's 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 just everything okay. you know so uh, <laughs> on a lighter note let me ask you 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 were selected as a mm -hmm. notable book author what did you feel about that really cool <laughs> i mean number one um surprised because okay. it's definitely a black book okay you know and i really fought for that cover i wanted it to be black it, let, me, let me show people again this is, yes this i the, the initial cover looked very different it did but yes it was all in black and white and you could not tell the ethnicity of the the people okay really? yeah it was very vague and 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 I'm like, you know what? That's not what my book is about, you know. And she gave me two other choices, and I picked this one because this woman looks so proud. Mm. She looks, she looks like, hey, you know what? It's rough, but I'm handling it. You okay. know what I mean? Okay. And I love that cover. I love that cover because it's so bright and colorful, and it speaks to the work. Here it is again. Yeah. It speaks to the word. You see it's, how her chin is lifted? Oh yeah, She's like, and? <laughs> so let me ask, in conclusion, why, should, why do you think somebody should read this book? Why do you think they, they should look at this book and read it? Mm. I think that there's some stories in there that will give them insights into other people's lives that might make them more empathetic, I'm hoping. I guess that's my hope, empathy. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say it was one of my favorite books of the year. Many of the committee members love this book. And I really hope anybody who's watching this today, uh, this is Shades by Esperanza Centrum uh, out of Detroit from Wayne State University Press. Uh, this is the Michigan Notable Books 2020 uh, segment on this book. Again, if you feel like you want to support this, uh, check in with our Library of Michigan Foundation, and the contact information can be found in the opening and closing credits of this segment. And Ms. Centron, thank you so much today for being with us, and do you have any parting words? Uh, thank you. This was fun. <laughs> yes, it was, and thank you. And thank you, everyone, and we'll see you at the next time for Michigan 2020 Michigan Notable Books.